Hey, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, as the case may be. And thank you for attending this PowerCast inside the Integrated File System, IFS, by Chuck Lazinski and Ash Giddings of Help Systems. My name is Ian Cartwright, and I'm Education Manager for Common, and I appear on your screen as a webcast host. If you experience any technical issues during the presentation, you can send me a chat message using the dialog box bottom right of the screen. If you'd like to send a written question to Chuck or Ash during the presentation, use the Q&A area, also in the lower right section of the screen, and select to send to all panelists. Uh, the presenters will answer your questions at the end of the presentation as time permits. Let me introduce our speakers. Uh, speaking today are Chuck Lazinski and Ash Giddings. Uh, Chuck has over 30 years of experience in IT, including 25 plus years on the IBM I platform. His background covers a wide variety of technical responsibilities involving system implementation, programming, operations, and support. And he's a certified as an IBM I systems administrator and as a help systems robot certified specialist. Also presenting as Ash Giddings. Uh, Ash began his career in IBM mainframe before moving on to mid-range systems, the I and AIX, and then Windows and Linux. He's worked for some of the largest data centers in Europe and has advised larger companies around the world on ways to save cost and improve efficiencies. What I am going to do now is hand control over to Chuck and have Chuck go ahead. Chuck? Thanks, Ian. Welcome, everybody. Let's take a look at our agenda and talk a little bit about what we're going to do today. This presentation is based on a class that we've been teaching here at Help Systems for going on 15 years now, uh, and we've been doing it online that whole time. And uh, just as one of the benefits of being a common member, uh, you're receiving this as part of your common membership. Uh, otherwise, if you want to dig into our IFS class uh, and the Help Systems website, certainly do that. There's also hands-on exercises associated with this. So what we're going to do is we're going to dive into exactly what is the IFS, how do you work with it, what's stored there, how do you monitor it, replication as well as uh, security for the IFS. And we do plan on doing a little bit of live demo on the way. And as Ian suggested, if you do have any questions or comments, feel free to jump right in. So this structure on IBM I called the Integrated File System has been around for a long time. It goes back to 1994. As you can see, it was added to OS 400, now IBM I. And ultimately, it was really a, a stroke of genius uh, because it gave us the ability to support other applications outside of our normal IBM I library-based applications and it brought the whole thought of a directory structure with a hierarchy to IBM I. This integrated file system contains some predefined file systems which we're going to talk about and you can design your own. Those predefined file systems have certain rules and limitations for instance around naming convention. right? And what's really kind of cool about it is that the library structure is just one of those structures that are included under the umbrella of the integrated file system. All right, so what might you see out there in the integrated file system? Certainly many of us have uh, imaging packages or document conversion packages for converting spool files into other formats such as PDF. So that's a typical use of integrated file system directories. Now, going beyond that, if you're supporting any sort of a, uh, a web page from your IVMI, our web page files are going to be stored there. Open source type applications, think PHP, Java, those uh, sorts of objects are going to be out there. Many of us use the image catalog to update our products from ISO images or to apply PTFs operating system updates, updates to our vendor applications and so forth. And digital, digital certificate manager files are also supported in the integrated file system. As far as the pre-shipped or the file structures that are shipped with the integrated file system, it looks like this. We start with the root, the uh, qopen sys subdirectory, which is the open systems, the Unix file structure. We've got the user-defined file structure. We're going to talk a little bit about that and how it relates to independent ASPs. QSys.lib, that's the library file system. Document library system, QDLS, that's a older, lower performance file system that was actually used back in the old Office Vision days. We'll talk a little bit about what that was all about. 
the uh, IBMI uh, net client file system, QNTC, think of the old X series Intel cards, integrated X series cards that were inserted into the uh, hardware. That's the file structure that supported that. QFileServe.400, that actually gives IBMI to IBMI visibility of your integrated file system directories. It's kind of a cool feature. You might have never looked at that before. And then uh, NFS, Network File System Structure. All right, so everything starts at the root. All those file systems that we just mentioned are supported from the root directory. So when we get to the security section, of course, we're gonna talk about protecting the root directory. What's stored in directories? Stream files. What is a stream file? A stream file is a file that doesn't contain necessarily fixed length records like a physical file in a library. So think of things like image files, um, uh, Microsoft document files, PDFs. All right. So the files themselves are sometimes referred to as links in the operating system. Uh, think of a symbolic link. All right. So that's a pointer to a stream file in another directory. And ultimately, what the integrated file system provides is really a high performance data access to your system from the outside world. All right. And Ian, we've got our first polling question. The question is, how are you using the integrated file system, or IFS? And we'll take about a minute to, to dive into that. And Ash, let's bring you on board here. Hi, Chuck. So, yes, so how are you using the uh, the IFS? So, um, multiple choice here. So, are you storing your, your documents there, your PDFs? Uh, maybe you have a map drive, like I do. I have a map drive and I, that's a real dumping ground for me. Maybe you're using the IFS for HTML and logs, maybe for HTTP or web-facing servers, such as Apache. Maybe for file sharing. So XML, JSON, flat files, and whatever else. Image catalogs as well. I know internally we use the IFS extensively for image catalogs. Or maybe you're not sure if you're using it or how you're using it. And hopefully today's education session, you'll be able to, uh, you'll be able to work out how you are probably using it. Yeah, I think that's really part of the equation, Ash, is doing a little bit of discovery uh, some folks don't think they're really using the integrated file system, but heck, the operating system uses the integrated file system extensively now. Yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah, I, it, it kind of, uh, I guess it swept in many years ago, and uh, I think it's used more and more now. There's very few applications out there that, that don't use it, I think. Yeah, and unfortunately, it gets ignored a little bit, and um, like you said, gets to be a little bit of a dumping ground, so we're going to talk about that as well. All right, looks like we're at the end of the poll, Ian. Yeah, gentlemen, the poll results are uh, applied. It looks like there might have been a technical issue. I'm showing 0%, so why don't we move on? All right, Ash, you've got control. I have indeed. So how do we work with the IFS? We, we know it's out there. And despite the fact that it's uh, it's been around now for uh, a quarter of a century, so since 3.1, which as a reminder, wasn't even RISC, it was a, a CISC operating system. Many sysadmins, as we've said, they shy away from it and only really get involved in managing it if they have to. So how can we get you more comfortable with it? Well, if you know DOS, you know the IFS, and most people know DOS. The standard directory commands to, to make, to change, uh, to remove are all available along with uh, copy and delete or copy and del so if you're more comfortable on green screen simply use work link wrk lnk just to enter and you'll get started you'll see your root directory so for developers out there and i know there's uh, there's a number of them out there today there are a number of apis available for accessing the ifs problematically um, let's start at the top, root directory. Although you can use both upper and lower case, no distinction is made, unlike traditional Unix operating systems where case is particularly key. Um, 
you can get very adventurous with path names, as it said on says on the point two here. Um, they can be long, they can be sizable, and remember that all file systems actually branch off root, so they branch off slash. When you go to root, in effect, you are this is how I used to think about it. You're lifting the lid. You're taking a screwdriver and you're lifting the lid off your power system, and you're looking straight into the top. I mentioned work link. This is this is where I started all those uh, all those years ago. So to access the IFS, use uh, use work link or work link space forward slash. Now the slash is optional. Without it, you're rooted to your current directory, and your current directory is defined in your user profile. So in your IBM I user profile, that's where your current directory is uh, is set. Um, once you're in it, you can do a a CD like you can in DOS, or you can use an I command, a Judge Kerr DIR, so C H G C U R D I R, to change your current directory. Nice and straightforward so far. Um, notice this is a, an example directory here. Um, notice that some of these directories are right out of the, the Unix and Linux environment. Some represent file systems. You file server dot 400 down the bottom there. Some were created by IBM for other purposes. Some are vendor directories, help systems. We can see that in there. And you'll see more and more vendor directories um, as the years go on, really. You may even see some individual stream files that are actually stored at root. We don't have any on the example screen, but in effect, there's nothing stopping you from storing individual stream files at, uh, at root level. Uh, help systems is at the root level. QDLS is also called the uh, the document library ob object structure, quite a mouthful. And as Chuck mentioned, this is what Office Vision used to use. I mentioned Q file server 400. Um, this is neat actually, and it allows IBM I to IBM I directory visibility. And we'll be seeing a little bit more on that as we go through. But hey, why use the green screen? IBM's brilliant access client solutions, uh, not to be confused with client access, um, has come on leaps and bounds really over the years and now lets you manage the IFS graphically. It's, uh, it's really neat. So access client solutions or ACS is a, it's a Java utility. So you can run it on Windows, Linux, you can run it on your Mac and for dealing with the, the IFS, uh, I found it super responsive. I'm, I'm hooked on the green screen purely because that's what I've always used and I'm used to the speed, I'm used to the, the, uh, the type ahead kind of facility, but I use ACS to navigate around. Uh, I use ACS to navigate around the, uh, the IFS. Uh, more on ACS a little later. Chuck, what's, uh, what kind of things stored on the IFS? That's a, that's a darn good question. Let's dive in. Let's dive in. All right. As mentioned, everything is under the root directory. And certainly the library structure, which is so critical to everything we do in most cases on our systems, is uh, stored there. And as mentioned, all the root directories or all the directories under the root have certain naming conventions and rules, all right? So we know how to work with the command line. We know how to work with libraries in the command line. And um, we know that for instance, libraries are always uppercase, all right? So that's one of the naming conventions associated with this particular file structure. Now you can, navigate the library structure through the work link command. All right, here we just simply went to the root directory. We're taking option five on qsys.lib. And in this case, we've navigated to the helpsys.lib subdirectory. All right, so there is a suffix on these objects and directories that are, or objects and libraries that are in qsys.lib pointing to the fact that these are specific object types 
in the library structure. And that's one of the one of the beautiful things about our library structure on IBM I and one of the things that have has helped it from a security standpoint over the years, file types can't change. All right, so you'll see an attribute physical file associated with these two files in my help sys library. All right, and you'll even notice that the uh, library object itself has a suffix of dot lib. So it can be a little bit much when you're um, typing out your your work link command because you have to maintain the suffixes as well in your navigation. Right. Q, uh, QDLS, let's dive into that a little bit. As mentioned, this was uh, a file structure that supported something called IBM Office Vision way, way back. Um, long before I even worked at Help Systems, the uh, Office Vision product was available and it was basically a, um, a, um, a uh, word processing type application and almost and literally a mail merge application that was available uh, in the operating system as a licensed product from IBM and it used this, this uh, document library system and the naming convention for the document library system was the old DOS naming convention. So an eight character prefix and a three character suffix. Now, one thing about it is this was out even before the integrated file system. Okay, so it was out before version 3.1 of the operating system and the subdirectories in the DLS really were spoken of as folders and folders within folders. I worked with some folks way back when that used the Office Vision DLO structure and that's how they referred to it as uh, as folders. It's not a high performance file structure in the integrated file system. However, we still see folks storing documents out there even today. But access to those documents is a little bit slower in this file structure, so we absolutely don't recommend using it anymore, and certainly it's probably time to move on from from the the uh, QDLS file structure. All right. Now, unlike QDLS, where everything is converted to uppercase and uh, you're limited to 8.3, we've got QOpenSys. This is the Unix structure. This is really one of the beautiful things that was added to our operating system back in. Uh, 3.1 and it's been enhanced ever since, this supports the Unix standards. All right, so for instance, in the Unix standards, upper and lower case naming is part of the equation and abided by, all right, so those are distinct objects. If you have uppercase, lowercase, or camel case, upper and lower case mix, those are all independent type objects. No limit to the hierarchy, unlike the library file structure that only has one level, no no limit here. Uh, as Ash mentioned, in this case, file names and directory names can be very large. And uh, of course, naming convention is at your uh, discretion. All right, so here we have two distinct files. Even though they have the same name, one's all uppercase, one's lowercase. Likewise, if we had a, a mixed case object listed here in QOpenSys, you would see that that would be a separate object type as well. Uh, as far as directory names in the green screen, and you're gonna see a lot of green screens in this presentation today, you can't necessarily see the entire directory name, but there is a way that you can pull it out of the display, and that's by using the F22 key. So if you have your cursor, on the line that has a large directory, if you hit F22, you will see that the directory name will be fully displayed. All right, so that's just a little a little trick in working with QOpenSys. Okay, working with QFileServe.400. Ash mentioned that this file system in the integrated file system gives you IBM I to IBM I directory visibility. And there's some requirements here. So first of all, the Q server subsystem needs to be active. 
when the connection is actually made, when you refer to the other system from your local system, it authenticates using the requesting jobs, user profile, and password. It does to work with Kerberos. So if you're in a single sign-on type environment, it will work with that as well. The actual communications is maintained for about two hours, but then as additional references are made, uh, that communication will be reestablished. And the other thing is that the references to the target system are not persistent. So when you IPL the system, those references need to be recreated. And so I guess the question is, how do you recreate those references? All right, so here I'm on uh, a system called iTeach. All right, one of our training systems here at Help Systems. And I'm going to add a directory to my qfileserve.400 subdirectory. And it says robot U. That is one of my target systems. Right. And now when I navigate, when I do a work link to display the contents of that subdirectory within QFileServe 400, it's actually showing the root directory of my robot U system. Right. So that's that's kind of interesting and could be potentially useful. All right, then we'll talk a little bit about the user-defined file system. You might be using this whether you know it or not. Uh, UDFS. Uh, UDFS was initially used to support those integrated X-series server cards or Intel cards that were inserted into your uh, uh, IBM I or AS400 chassis. And uh, now they're used to support independent ASP technology. And because it's user defined, they can be uh, defined however you see fit or however the vendor sees fit or however IBM sees fit. So you decide things like naming convention for this user defined file system. There are commands associated with these for creating, displaying the user defined file system. And then to actually use the user-defined file system, you must mount the file system over another directory. So there's a mount command. Okay. And likewise, when you want to make that file system unavailable, you would unmount that file system. Right now, so what's kind of cool about that is you could, for instance, back up the entire custom structure just by saving the block special file stream file, that is the user defined file system blob, so to speak. All right, and that would that would save that um, for potentially restoring to another system or just as uh, some type of incremental backup. All right, so that's the user defined file system. All right, and then there's NetServer. Of course, this is the, uh, what you're looking at is Access Client Solutions and the uh, Explorer access to the integrated file system. So Windows Explorer, and what we're talking about here is creating file shares, All right? So Ash mentioned that he has a file share associated with his uh, IBM I that he uses on a regular basis and he can store things there. And likewise, if, for instance, you're converting spool files into PDFs and those PDFs need to be made available, this would be how you would do it. So you must create a file share. The recommendation is, of course, don't share the root. And you can make shares read only, for instance, so data can be pulled but not pushed from the outside world onto your IBM I. So navigating around the integrated file system in the green screen can be a little challenging. And likewise, uh, you've got some options here with Navigator. Also from a commercial standpoint, Help Systems has been providing a disk space analysis and exploratory tool and really a, a maintenance tool for your traditional library storage as well as integrated file system storage. And this tool provides real-time monitoring, analysis, and alerting, depending on what sort of thresholds you want robot space to uh, monitor for. It also provides library and IFS analysis and cleanup. All right, so we can actually 
go out to your server and analyze the in, an integrated file system directory and remove old files as you see fit or as you need a particular directory cleaned up. All right. So we can clean up the integrated file system. We can clean up old save files. We can clean up old spool files and so forth. So we can do both analysis and we can do storage cleanup of the integrated file system. All right, we're gonna do a live demo of robot space. We're also going to just navigate around the integrated file system just, just a little bit. All right, so let's share my, uh, share my monitor. And Ash, can you see my monitor? Okay. We can indeed, we can see a green screen with them. All right, All right. We're, yeah, we're gonna just start with the green screen. And as Ash mentioned, if you execute the work with object links command, what that's going to do is it's gonna take you to the current directory as defined on your user profile. All right, so you can see that I have a home directory. It's called Chuck. I have all rights to the Chuck directory. And that's one of our recommendations around the integrated file system is that if you do have users that need to have storage on your IBMI in a file share, uh, create a specific directory for them. And then on our user profile, define what directory that is, All right? So if I navigate into my user profile, uh, you will see there is my home directory. So that's my current directory, All right? So go back and edit their user profile, make sure that their current directory is defined, All right? If I specify work with object links with a forward slash, that of course takes me into the root, and option five is the drill down. All right, so I can drill down into my various directories and page down through all the various subdirectories that are off of the root. You'll see that we have a number of uh, vendor and personal type directories that are off of <coughs> the subdirectory or off of the root directory. And eventually you'll see that um, qsys.lib file structure will be here. And I just scroll down and there'll be a little bit of a pause. There we go. And that takes me down to qsys.lib. There's qopensys and so forth. Now, if I did want to navigate into any particular directory, work with object links. If I do, for instance, slash home slash Chuck, of course, we know that's not going to work. It says, well, you need to use parentheses. All right, so we're going to enclose our navigation in single parentheses, and that takes us now into the appropriate directory. All right, and actually let's let's go back in there. And let's navigate in here. All right, so navigating around IBMI uh, in the IFS and uh, maybe analyzing the size of some of these objects, what, <clears throat> when they were created and so forth, that can be a little bit burdensome. All right, so, Here's Robot Space. This is a graphical interface to exploring and working with you, all of your disk storage, including IFS, all right? And the product itself starts with some live monitors. And it says right down here that robot job status is active for, for uh, auxiliary storage pools, job temporary storage, QTAMP. I have spool file monitoring, live monitoring turned off at the moment. But ultimately, what this will tell you is, for instance, on your storage ASPs, whether you have, uh, you know, whether it's SysBase or an independent ASP, I have both here. This will tell you where you've been and where you're going. All right, so this blue line indicates my storage here over the past uh, 30 days or so. All right, it also shows me temporary storage. It also shows me with these horizontal lines where my thresholds are. You can see I exceeded a threshold here, all right, going back just uh, before October 19th, all right. If we want to go out a longer period of time, history summary, okay, so this is my average used for the day and my peak used for the day going back 12 months, and I could store even more historical summary data as well. This black line indicates my actual storage on the system. So you can see back here about a year ago, we bumped up the storage a little bit on this particular partition. All right. If we 
have thresholds set up. We also have an hourly growth threshold. So if I grow more than 5%, I can be notified. We also have uh, job temporary storage monitoring for uh, temp storage, QTemp, and spool files. So if a job takes off and starts creating a multi-million page spool file, for instance, you could put some thresholds around that. Okay, so that's happening all the time. As far as keeping your system nice and tidy, there are storage audits or cleanup processes built into the product as well, right? These storage audits can be submitted immediately or they can be scheduled either in a product like Robot Schedule or, or other schedulers. And just some of the cleanup processes that can be done, we can clean up old spool files and out queues. We can create an audit report of new or restored objects to your system. We can clean up old IFS directories, delete unused save files, unused journal receivers, and so forth, all right? So that's some cleanup. But what I think the real power of this product is the ability for it to do a storage collection to help you navigate around the integrated file system or the library structure. All right, so I've created a, a collection called Detail. And from here, I can submit it immediately. Typically, it'd be done once a day, or I can, again, schedule it during off hours. All right, the storage collection on my systems has been running a while. So I have uh, running for a while, and I have a year's worth of history here. All right, so right now I could drill into my most recent collection and I could go down to my IFS directories and immediately I know what directories are the largest on my system. I also know what's new in the last week since my previous collection. So all these are new stream files or directories on my system. And I also have the ability to drill into these as well. So for instance, if I right click and I say, show me the collected objects. All right, here's the objects in that, in that directory. All right, so it looks like I got a couple of dumps or log files here. They're taking a lot of space. Maybe I should be doing some cleanup. So maybe what I need to do is create a report of those selected records and just create it on the fly and uh, send that out to somebody who maybe can do some cleanup for me, all right? And then finally, if for instance, you really don't know what's growing in the integrated file system and you wanna have robot space tell you, you can select any two collections and I'm gonna go back 12 months and I wanna know, uh, well, what's changed the most in my libraries and my file members or potentially in my directory. So let's, Let's take a look and uh, see what's changed the most in the last 12 months in my integrated file system directory structure. And Ash, what do you think it's gonna be? God, I would imagine it will be some performance related data. Well, that's what I thought too. And, but sure enough, it was this, uh, this vendor directory, all right? And so what I can do is I can say, okay, this, this object or this directory changed the most in the last 12 months. Let's look at the history of that over the last 12 months. So it looks like back in March, it took a jump, all right? So these are my data points and it's just been sitting there. So that that those dump files that have been sitting there since uh, April have just been taking up space. So it looks like we need to do a little cleanup, all right? Very valuable and easy to use tool. Gives you a fighting chance in the integrated file system, which a lot of people consider to be kind of a kind of a black hole. All right, Ash, back over to you. Thank you. I think that's my favorite feature, Chuck, in uh, Robert Space to be able to pick any two points in time. Um, it's hard without a tool to do that. You know, you have to be collecting some kind of data and pumping it into Excel and doing all sorts of comparison. Time consuming, really time consuming. Brilliant. So. Let's take a little look. How do we monitor the uh, the IFS? Well, we've got a series of commands that we're going to take a, a closer look at. Um, we're going to take a look at uh, directory commands, link, copy, check in, check out, how to save and restore. That can be quite uh, quite troublesome, and some bits in and around authority. So there's there's definitely 
two trains of thought. I mentioned this earlier when dealing with the IFS, green screen or ACS. Um, you can create and delete directories easily enough with, uh, with MD, make directory or create directory, or obviously to remove it, RD or uh, remove the commands. Um, when you use a command, you can set the public authorities and auditing values at the time the command is run. So these are green screen commands. You can set those values when you run the command using F4. Using ACS, um, defaults are used. I'm not sure if you can control those defaults. I've not found a way yet, but defaults are actually used. Um, so you would create a folder. You would then have to go back into it afterwards and, and set permissions. And you can do that from that permissions option in there. So possibly a little bit slower, but hey, you know that's what we do in and around managing uh, Windows file systems with Windows Explorer anyway. So it's nothing new. It's it's not that uh, not that cumbersome. So for those favouring the uh, the command line, you can navigate around using CD, change current directory. If you lose track of where you are. You can always use discur dir, display current directory. Alternatively, I have to bring in my friend the ACS again. You can forget about those commands and just make IFS, the IFS just feel like Windows Explorer, an extension to Windows Explorer. You can see at a glance where you are in the directory structure and you can change current directory simply by double clicking on a directory really, really easily. Um, Programmatically, retrieve current directory is uh, is available for you, to, for you to use within your within your code. Let's have a look at uh, some link commands now. So the IFS commands for link manipulation are pretty straightforward, allowing you to add, delete, display, and rename IFS objects. Nice and straightforward much like the uh, the equivalents in Unix and in DOS. Uh, copy commands, uh, you can take time to, to learn CPY and MOV, or, and you can see where I'm going here, you can use the right mouse button in ACS to copy or to cut and paste objects. The stream file commands you see there allow you to copy data in, sorry, to copy data in between a stream file and a library object. So for example, a physical file. And I guess to a lesser extent, I'm not sure if it's used now, to a uh, to a spreadsheet format using the copy to imp command. Copy to stream file. Um, this allows you to copy a save file or my, more likely a physical file to a, an IFS housed uh, stream file optionally converting the data and if necessary reformatting it upon execution of this command and you do that by using the parameters such as the, the data conversion options database file ccs id and stream file code page um, chuck do you want to show us how to monitor key ifs elements Yes, absolutely. Let's go live again. Love those live demos. All right, looks like I'm sharing my screen now. And uh, so as you're aware, IBM I supports uh, web technology, of course, has for many years. And if you look in the subsystems that are uh, potentially running on your system right now, you should see a QT HTTP server subsystem. And the uh, navigator technology that uh, Ash was just showing you, you'll see that running here with the uh, admin jobs. But I'm gonna scroll down a little bit and you'll see in this case, we've got some SQL web interface. This is our SQL product, has a web interface supported from IBM I. Right. And we've got some web docs jobs as well, supporting the web interface for our document management tool. All right. So we're not getting a whole lot of information here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up my friend Robot Monitor. Okay. This is a 
product that's been part of the robot product line for a few years now. And it is IBM I native monitoring technology that allows you to create something like this. All right, this is the dashboard that's uh, very graphical, brings a lot of information into one place and also supports multiple partitions in a single dashboard. It supports threshold notification, uh, historical reporting, disk analysis, and so forth. All right, so this is kind of like all in one. And you can see we've got some issues here, for instance, with some subsystems that aren't active. I could actually right click and uh, start the subsystem here. Here's what's currently going on with my system in terms of CPU and disk and number of spool files and a couple of out queues. This is all live information. We collect this information every 30 seconds. But what I want to show you is back to that QHTTP server. Um, and that was on my wisdom system. So I'm going to go down to my wisdom system. And uh, I've got you know quite a few real time metrics that I'm looking at. Uh, on that uh, particular partition, but I want to look at my. Um, HTTP application server. So I created another group of metrics here. All right, you can see I've got banking jobs, robot jobs, power tech jobs, and then I've got this uh, this web jo web jobs. All right, and it says that I've got a, a thread count issue here with my web docs uh, jobs. All right, so currently it says I've got 53 threads total with my uh, web docs. Um, jobs and likewise 101 with my SQL web interface. Now, interestingly enough, SQL web interface is green at 101. WebDocs is at 53 and it's it's red. All right, uh, SQL web interface, I've got 11 jobs active. Okay, maybe I should have a few more restart jobs active. And likewise, here's the total CPU utilization for all the jobs total in the QHTTP server, right? So 53 jobs for web docs. Um, we could drill into that. You can see it's just been sitting at 53 for a while, but we also have historical reporting. So I could say, well, what's the, what's my average here, my monthly average for the number of threads uh, for my web docs application since I've been monitoring it. So going back to January, I didn't have anything prior to that. It looks like I've been sitting right around 50. So you know what, maybe that that 53 is an adequate amount and I should uh, up my threshold a little bit. Okay, so this is single system. Uh, we can also look from a multi-system view. All right, now here I've got two systems, my Academy and Wisdom system, both with SQL Web Interface and my WebDocs HTTP applications running. All right, and then I'm also doing some measurements here. All right, so here's my thread counts for both systems, and here's my CPU usage for QHTTP server overall. And I've even incorporated in Java CPU monitoring because obviously we've got some Java applications with data stored in the IFS as well. Okay, so that's a little bit about performance and monitoring. Of course, part of the monitoring is also disk storage. So incorporated into this tool is some IFS monitoring, somewhat like robot space, but not quite as granular. And so what you're going to see is just like robot space, we do a disk collection, in this case with robot monitor. And what you're seeing initially here are my top libraries currently for the month of October. This is the average for the month of October. And here I could say, well, let's let's go look at directories. All right. So the largest directory on my system, just like what Robot Space said was QOpen Sys. Here's that, here's that Skybot directory. All right. So from within Robot Monitor, I could click into Skybot. Here's my averages for that directory for October every day. Looks pretty stable. And likewise, I could say, well, let's look at that information over the last 12 months. And just like what Robot Space told me, we had a little bump here in March. All right now, I cannot drill down to the stream file level at this point. The object level 
but um, that's what robot space is for. There also is one green screen component uh, with robot monitor that does allow you to get drill down to the object level, but uh, no cleanup is available in uh, robot monitor for the integrated file system where we have cleanup processes that are available uh, in robot space. So if you'd like to see maybe a little comparison be between space and robot monitor, uh, we'd be happy to oblige you. But robot monitor is really sort of an all-in-one monitoring technology for IBM I. And Ash, we're going to turn it back over to you. Great, thank you, Chuck. And the one thing that always strikes me with Robot Monitor, obviously I'm a techie, when, um, when it first became available, I downloaded it, obviously didn't read any, any manuals because I'm a techie, um, is how quick it is. It, it's lightning quick. I don't think I've used a product that's that quick to, to gather that, that uh, level of information. Okay, so uh, how do we back up or uh, replicate the uh, the IFS. Let's uh, let's take a little uh, little look at that. Well, I find that many people we've mentioned it. Many people neglect the IFS. In fact, we've got a customer that generates in excess of thirty thousand stream files a day. I, I can't believe that all these are, uh, are required, but uh, they they tell me they're required. So we have to manage them for them. But generating this many can lead to problems with regards to backup. If they are critical, they need backing up and therefore potentially restores too. So let's take a little look. Now, most applications use the IFS now. There are very few 5250 only applications. So whether it's used to store log files, um, house Apache configuration or something else. Um, and the commands we use to, uh, to back up the IFS um, is the SAV command. To recover an object or restore an object, just the Rust command. Um, they're tiny commands, but the scope for mistyping them due to the, uh, I guess the complex level of directories that could be involved is, uh, is huge. So the more you know about your application and how it uses the IFS, the better. Um, you may not feel, you, you may find you know, not, don't need to buy, back up the, these parts of the IFS every single time you do a backup or every single night. So find out a little bit more about uh, how your application is using the IFS. Now, the SAV command requires a, a mixture of RBMI syntax that we're all used to, and uh, let's just call it PC syntax. So you can prompt that. And notice we give the directory path to the tape drive, TAP01. We have to tell it it's a device description. And remember, you reference objects within the library directories, just as if they were directories as well. Single quotes, people often get trips up with the number of single quotes required as well. So keep an eye on that, as this screen denotes here. So for most of us, doing a, uh, a backup of uh, slash asterisks will get everything we need to worry about. And depending on how large your backup window is, you might want to consider getting a little bit more granular. Uh, note the ability to um, include and exclude certain paths here. That's particularly key. Um, top tip, it's not on this screenshot, but there's a parameter actually on the SAV command, it's called asynchronous bring. And having this set to yes, depending on your directory tree structure on your system and the amount of memory you've got available, um, asynchronous bringing the objects using that command, using a, a yes on that command, uh, might improve the save performance. And that command actually defaults to no. So it might be worth experimenting with that in uh, in development or on test just to see if that does speed it up. So that's a, an async bring. A little bit about journaling. I guess we're all familiar with uh, with journaling of physical files and, uh, and other objects, but journaling of IFS objects is as simple as journaling physical files or database files. You require a journal, you require a receiver, and you simply start and end journaling using strjourn and end journal. Nice and easy. Uh, integrated file system objects, so stream files, directories, symbolic links, 
which Chuck mentioned, can be journaled. But QDLO, which is the old uh, office vision uh, structure, that can't be journaled. That needs to be handled outside of journals. And uh, Robot HA actually allows you to, um, helps you to replicate these, these uh, IFS libraries, directories, I should say, with, uh, with ease. And we're going to take a little look, little live look at Robot HA in a minute. In fact, Robot HA can replicate as much or as little as you like on IBM I. Um, some customers and some environments use Robot HA to simply replicate maybe a subset of data, a selection of libraries and some IFS objects. They might replicate that for BI purposes. They might replicate that for, for development or test purposes to another partition. Other customers we have replicate pretty much everything, everything you see on that production machine. And that's so that they can roll swap in the event of a disaster. So I'm just going to share my screen now and just show you what Robot HA looks and feels like. And we're going to replicate something in real time. So this is my, uh, this is my target machine here, this, uh, this yellow one here. And uh, as you can see, I've got some, uh, I'm in root and we have uh, apps, apps two, three, four, sorry, two, three, five, and eight. So let's go to my source machine, green on black. Um, I have a machine called Bruno here. I'm going to show you how easy it is. We're going to replicate the apps for directory. So nice and easy, F6 to create. It asks us what we want to replicate going to replicate an item. Well, let's replicate um, an IFS item. As you can see, a library or something system related is just as easy. Can't remember what the directory is called. So let's uh, let's use prompt and apps four. In fact, what we should do, yeah, apps four. Uh, where do we want to replicate it to? Well, we're going to replicate that to our backup machine. We can optionally uh, change the directory name when it gets over to our target machine or to our backup machine. But let's just hit enter. Just want to show you how easy it is to do that. We're just talking to the other end. We're making sure the other end's there. We have a, a sync item there now. So all we need to do is to, to start replication. So if I can get over to the, uh, the other side quick enough and just refresh that, you can see that's now there, and we have a number of objects in there. Really, really quick, really easy. Um, I can also, this is, uh, this is my source machine. So this is using Windows Explorer to view my source machine. Um, I can delete some objects from here. If I delete these, uh, these objects here, these JPEGs and these PNGs. This is taking them off the source machine, five objects, nice and quick. If I jump back to, uh, to here, they'll be deleted from my source machine, from Bruno, that's where I've taken them from. If I look inside my, my apps four folder, you can see they're deleted from there. Those objects can be journaled. So the, the replication and the tidying up, anything I change, add, delete, all happens pretty much in real time. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now. Ash, that was a great demo. Thank you, Chuck. Yeah. So back to your good self. All right, we're going to spend just a couple of minutes talking about securing the integrated file system. And uh, for those of you who are responsible for permissions and uh, security on your IBM I, certainly the IFS should not be ignored. One of the unique things about the integrated file system is that uh, it uses, and you'll see that there are actually multiple security types associated with the IFS directories. IBM I or OS 400, Unix, and PC type security are all incorporated into the uh, integrated file system. Of course, you do need special rights to work with the uh, security administration in the IFS. And, you know, typically when we talk about security and permissions, we talk about privileges. That's how we refer to it in this, uh, in this area. 
In terms of the integrated file system, the commands are slightly different for working with authority. So for instance, instead of display object authority, it's display auth, work auth, change auth, and instead of change object owner, it's change owner. So those are the commands, the primary commands. You can also navigate around authority and display authority and change authority through the work link command. There's an option nine to work with authority. And as you can see, there are some different authority types than maybe what you might be expecting to see in, um, uh, or what you would normally see in uh, a, a library type object. So we're gonna see some abbreviations here like read, write, and execute. And depending on what sort of writes that your user profile service profile, group profile needs to have access to the directory structure and the objects in the directory, you're going to have to uh, take a close look at those. For instance, public authority. Okay, so our default public authority is always something that we need to think about. And likewise, for new objects created in a directory, what should the default public authority be? All right, so we can define that as well when we work with or change authority on a directory. All right. So we do have some security recommendations. So take a look at your root access. All right, the ship default is data authority, rewrite and execute and object authority star all for public. We recommend data authority, read and execute only, object authority none in the root. Okay, that's where you're gonna have subdirectories take care of that for uh, public. Uh, we mentioned as far as individual directories for your users, put those into the home directory and secure them appropriately, typically probably something like a read, write and execute. You can also restrict access to qsys.lib from remote access by using this special authorization list that IBM has provided. And FYI, it's shipped with public use. You might wanna check this. Recommended permissions is public exclude. Also, uh, a little reminder to manage your file shares and specifically, don't share root. All right, you can also turn on auditing Great object auditing for sensitive directories. And likewise, there are several IBMI security webinars by Carol Woodbury and Robin Tatum, both uh, uh, involved in our cybersecurity initiative here at Help Systems and well known in the industry. And there are some uh, webinars and presentations archived on the Common website. And if you're a Common member, certainly you should be taking advantage of those. Security scan. So people often say to me, how do I know what I don't know? And the security scan provided by Help Systems helps answer that question. Um, it's free. Um, we have one for I and for Linux and for AX now actually as well. It runs in minutes and it provides you with a, a graphical representation as to how secure your machine is right now. It gives you that stake in the ground. Uh, very high level, uh, traffic light based report. So it's something you can take away. And it covers things such as mentions here, user permissions. Um, so the most exploited method of compromising the machine includes um, an ana analysis of your user and security and password settings, uh, admin privileges, public authority, Chuck mentioned it, it's always a, a, a gray area, a strong indication as, as to how your system is to Joe Bloggs, to the average user. Uh, network access, FTP access, system security, so that's system values, and we talk about IFS today, IFS related exit points. It also provides recommendations as well. So these are prioritized in English by risk and time to address the risk. So. It's a great service and we do hundreds of these a year. PowerTech antivirus. Uh, Help System provides a, a native antivirus with detection and removal for the IFS in the form of uh, PTAV, PowerTech antivirus for IBMI. And uh, due to the, I guess the uniqueness of the IBMI 
object infrastructure. Antivirus can be a controversial topic, but, uh, but while native libraries and objects are highly virus resistant, the dirty secret is what we've talked about today, the IFS, um, extremely prone to viral attack. So um, PowerTech Antivirus for I permits native scanning pro by providing the engine for the operating system. Um, and remember, PCI regulations require antivirus solutions to be implemented on every server that is in scope. It used to be a recommendation. Now it's a uh, now it's a must. And I know Chuck, you've encountered one or two customers that have had some kind of infection on the IFS. Yeah, and they, uh, you know, they've had to do restores and uh, certainly go back and review their integrated file system. All right, so let, that brings us to our next polling question. How would you like us to follow up with you? So Ian, if you'd launch that. So if you'd like to follow up on a robot space or monitor demo or robot H8 demo, certainly we'd be happy to do that. A free security scan, highly recommended. Total process takes about an hour. And then there's something called a tech update. And the tech update is a one-on-one -on -one discussion where we talk about, uh, first of all, your roadmap and what your needs and and uh, priorities are and then we talk about the technologies that you might own from help systems and what the roadmap is for them we'd love to talk to you so here's what we talked about uh, we talked about a lot about uh, many things in the integrated file system there's a lot there to discover and learn about so don't stop the learning process uh, specifically we talked about robot monitor and space from a monitoring standpoint and then we talked about high availability using and data replication using robot ha and if you're already a robot customer, thank you. Thank you, Chuck. So our, our IBM I focus hasn't changed. If uh, if anything, it's uh, it's got better. So new tools, new interfaces. Some of them through through acquisition that we've uh, that we've robotized. Uh, some of them we've built from the ground up. Um, whether you're looking to secure, to monitor, to automate, or to replicate data, um, help systems is your your one-stop shop. All right, we do have a couple of questions. We'll just spend maybe 60 seconds uh, answering a couple of questions. Otherwise, um, we will follow up afterwards. Uh, Chuck, before we do that, can I just say that as you are, please do fill out the poll, and as you are, make sure that you submit it. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what happened with the poll at the top of the session, but none were actually submitted, even though many people took it. So start the poll, finish it, and then submit uh, the answers, and I appreciate it. Go ahead, Chuck. All right. Uh, well, we've got a question. Can a file share be created from a green screen? And uh, Trong? Um, I'm not sure. I don't think so. I've only done file shares from Navigator. Ash, what do you think? I was going to say exactly the same thing. I, I don't know. I've only, I've only done it from a, uh, from a GUI. We'll check and come back to you on that one. Yeah, yeah, okay. And uh, is Robot Space part of Robot Monitor or is it a separate purchase? Yeah, Space and Monitor are separate. Right? A little bit of different functionality. We'd love to do a compare or contrast for you if you have time. And uh, any of those products, of course, are available for a, a trial period. So if you want to do a 30-day trial, we can absolutely do that. And uh, another question we have is, um, we run retrieve disk info on IFS. Why is robot space better? Uh, well, first of all, robot space gives you historical information, gives you cleanup gives you that nice comparison where you can select any two collections and compare IFS, stream file, libraries, and so forth. And it's all graphical too, right? Point and click, easy to use. And Ian, I think that will do it for now. We have uh, just a couple of follow-ups uh, from the Q&A that we will do otherwise. Thanks to everybody for joining. All right, uh, thank, you. thank you everybody. Uh, there will be a replay of this webcast as well as uh, version of the PowerPoint slides, we will send it out in the next day or so to the email that you submitted when you registered for this event. And uh, finally, do submit the polls as you finish it, because I see many people have started it, but nobody has actually submitted. So something odd is going on there. Uh, please submit as you leave the event. And thank you, Ash. And thank you, Chuck. Everybody have a great day.